26 years old, if you can believe that. So I'm about half your age, I think. Are you guys, you guys juniors, seniors? What are you guys? Sophomores. Juniors. juniors? Okay. I had classes right here in this room. I took Spanish in that room next door. The desks were arranged a little differently, but I usually would have sat in what would have been like these two desks or like your two desks. So um, it's really fun to come back here. Um, here's the thing. I found out two days ago that a friend of mine um, from college passed away. He actually died two years ago and I didn't even know about it. And what it makes me start thinking about is how I'm not the kid that I used to be. I still think of myself as being your age. Um, your teacher tells me that you guys are thinking about growing up. And I'm here to tell you, I think that's a bad idea. <laughs> I think that you guys should stay kids your entire lives. When I was little, there was a movie called Hook. And there was this line in it where Tinkerbell goes and finds Peter Pan and she tells him, I can track you anywhere. Because she knows the way that he smells. And when he asks her what that smells like, she says, like someone who's ridden the back of the wind. Like somebody who's had a hundred fun summers of chasing pirates and sleeping in trees. This is sort of that way that I think about what life should look like. I want you guys to spend your time having adventures and doing something that's meaningful. And I'm pretty lucky because I got to do some of that. Um, I got started late. I didn't do that when I was your age a lot. I typically didn't know where I was going when I was young. My wife announced on the first day of the first grade that she was going to be an American astronaut. I didn't know what I was going to be. When I was in middle school, I wanted to do drama, and I wanted to perform. When I got into college, I wanted to fly in space myself, and I had a professor tell me in 2000 that the shuttle program would be dead by 2011, and he was right. I remember the last flight going up. So he talked me out of doing that. Um, later, I've had other interests, but essentially, I got frustrated that people would talk me out of doing the things that I wanted to do with my life. This is my life. Why should anybody have influence over me and what I want to do? So while I'm in my 20s, I become a climber. I've climbed in about 25 countries. And I was in India, where some of the largest mountains of the world are, Mount Kanchenjunga, right by K2 and Everest. And in a hotel room, I saw all these cabbies park their cars one night in a parking lot, and they slept there. And I thought, how strange that you could be employed your entire life and be homeless your entire life. Because in America, one of those two things is going to get us, right? We don't have that class of people over here. So I come back and I say to myself, i got to make changes. Now I'm a shy kid, and I said to myself, I'd rather be dead than keep not doing the things that I want to do with my life. One wrong turn, I run for office. Two wrong turns, I get elected. <laughs> I'm a two-time member of the House of Representatives. I am a senator right now. I sit on some of the most powerful committees like Appropriations, Ways and Means, Joint Committee for Capital Review, Budget Debt, Federalism, and Fiscal Mandates. It's been a good run. I enjoy myself at the Capitol. But the best part of my job is getting back to places like this and giving you guys a little bit of insight. I didn't have the chance to speak candidly with people who had gotten to places and done some things. And I wanted you to have that opportunity. So for me, I'm thrilled to be here. Like I said, I'm one of yours. And I'm hoping that when you guys leave here today, you will say to yourself, if I ever get asked to come back to this high school, I would do it. And you too can tell stories about the rooms that you sat in, the desks that you sat in, the classes you took, and some of your friends. Make sense? So, what would you guys like to talk about? You have your whole lives ahead of you. We can hit government, we can hit history. Where would you like to begin? Yes, sir. Senator Sherwood, I'm wondering, what do you believe is the most pressing political issue in Arizona right now? <laughs> well, there's two answers to that. The first one would be like, probably something like, you know, money, funding for education, right? How do we actually do commerce or run government? But I would say that that's sort of like within the government side of, of the answers. Let me give you an alternative answer. I think the way that people consume media and the way that people have public discourse, and the way that you all talk with each other about politics, that's more pressing. Because if you don't assemble the right people in government, then I can assure you, you will never get something good from government. So to me, the place where you address that, that question, that's on your side of the equation, as voters, right? You guys are gonna be voting soon, and you'll be voting your whole lives, I hope. Statistically speaking, most of you will not start voting until you're in your late 20s, early mid 30s. 
I hope that you will be outliers and make it a point to not be those people. Additionally, as voters, I hope that you will be outliers and be the informed kind, the ones that go all the way down the ballot, the ones that do all your homework on whatever it is. Do you guys know, do you plan on being Democrats? Do you plan on being Republicans? Do you have any thoughts on where your political ideology would lay? No? Wait. <laughs> I'm gonna take a vote right now. Everyone who wants to be a Democrat, raise your hand. Not high enough people, all the way up. <laughs> Thank you, put your hands down. Republicans, raise your hands. Thank you, hands down. Independents, raise your hands. Thank you. Okay. So, I mean, that's pretty normal, right? A, a mixed bag of answers. As an elected official, my enemy is not the Republican Party, as I am a Democrat. My enemy is the person who went into politics to make their own uninformed decision as quickly as possible. My enemy is the person who wants to go down and says, because I'm from a political party, those are the votes that I intend to cast as frequently as possible, right? I'm gonna give you the courtesy of letting you talk me into your idea as long as it holds merit. I hope that you will give me that same courtesy. Do you think that we always have that though in politics? Not in our head, no, no, no. Why not? Because a lot of people are informed and they're kind of just like, my opinion's the right opinion. That's right, that's right. Let me ask you guys this. Okay, you guys become elected officers or elected officials and something that you actually campaigned for or against comes up in your official capacity. You then become an expert as you are now elected, now you're studying things differently. You have staff, you have people help you wade through the issues. And you decide, I might have been wrong on that issue. It's coming up for a vote, okay? And you are convinced that this bill will take your constituents off the cliff. Maybe they're gonna lose healthcare, maybe they're gonna lose education, maybe they're gonna lose jobs, maybe they're gonna lose security of some kind. Do you uphold the promise you made on the campaign trail? and vote as you intended to do while you were campaigning for that office, knowing this is a bad idea and it will hurt the people you care about? Or do you do an about face, switch your position, go the other way and tell those constituents, oh, trust me, you'll love it, I changed my mind. What do you guys wanna do? Do you think that elected officials ever have to deal with this paradox? What would you like me to do? I cast votes that impact you all the time, right? We pass $9 billion budgets. This is a lot of money. This influences your lives, your parents' lives. What would you guys like me to do? Think that I should do what I think is right for us, even though that might contradict my former opinion of the campaign. Okay, and that's reasonable. Would anybody like to argue the alternative? Thoughts? I mean, it's kind of true that you told everyone about this thing and then you lied about it. And right. It's kind of right. Bad, huh? Right. So I mean, that that's absolutely right, right? We have a term for that, it's called flip-floppers, right? Oh, you know that guy, he'll just go the path of least resistance. He'll say one thing until it's convenient, and then he goes the other way, right? Both reasonable. Let me tell you what I do. I'm gonna vote the way that I wanna vote. And I believe that I campaigned on running the most intelligent, most informed platform that I could, and I told people that I reserve the right to change my mind if new information presents itself and new opportunities become available. So I build into my platform that I am a guy who will always make the best decision possible. Now on my desk, on the floor of the House of Representatives and the Senate, I've kept a token. Now, if these two ladies are Republicans, maybe they would keep little elephants on their desks. And maybe our Democratic caucus over here, they have little donkeys on their desk. What's on my desk is a statue of a friend of mine named Muhammad Ali. The champ lost his heavyweight belt in boxing because he didn't want to answer the draft for the Vietnam War. This is probably the most coveted prize in professional sports. 
And what I think about when I'm on the floor is my job is not to get reelected. My job is to do the right thing for everybody. My job is to vote for all the good bills and none of the bad ones. And so I don't have my political identity on the floor. I have somebody who becomes you know, symbolic of willing to relinquish that is prized for what is just. Make sense? And that's how I help my desk in the House and the Senate. Other questions? What do you guys want to hit?